Hey, let's bring in our next guest, Delegate Mike Height, who joins us via telephone from the uh, Capitol. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, gentlemen. Now, you guys have been pretty busy down there these last few days uh, with uh, a lot of different bills being passed. I know the Senate has passed their version of a campus carry as well. The House has, been, has worked on that, too. Mike, what are the odds of that becoming law by the end of this session? Um, I would say 50-50. You never know with these types of things. Uh, they can be controversial. There's a lot of uh, opposition to it, but there's also a lot of, um, you know, a lot of positive uh, talk about it. So um, I, I don't know. I'd say 50-50. I know the schools are against it. It, it, with the opposition to campus carry, and I know that there was a, a pretty good contingent of uh, students who showed up recently at the Capitol to protest it as well. Is that going to carry any weight ultimately? Um, I, you know, I don't think so. There was a large contingency, but I think they expected that. And, you know, there were also people that, that stood up and, and spoke in favor of it as well. And, and you know, there was uh, actually an individual that stood up in committee um, who was a um, a state police officer um, in the Virginia Tech shooting, um, and and talked about you know how he he had to step over bodies and you know the the things he saw and you know wiping off his shoes afterwards and how it affected him, um, and in the end he came out in in uh, you know for the the bill and saying you know if just one individual one individual student um a law-abiding citizen had had a gun um he could have possibly stopped uh the mass shooting or or kept it to a whole lot minimum so i you know i i guess it it depends on if if you're really really against this you're going to still be really really against this um and if you're really really for it then you're going to be really really for it still so i i I expect that it'll probably pass, um, but I'm still saying 50 50. There are 11 states that have campus carry, and West Virginia is among them. Reading on this Metro News article, another 20 that have no law that prevents carrying on a campus. We had the Michigan State University shooting uh, very recently, and uh, that one uh, struck home for me. I mentioned earlier this week, my nephew goes there. And one of the three students killed was the fraternity he belongs to. That was their fraternity president, who was a sophomore. My nephew is a senior, uh, who was murdered uh, by this uh, this idiot, uh, who was just the latest in a long list of people carrying out mass shootings in this country. And, and you get into debates on this subject because some of these targets, and the reason why they're targeted is because, in many cases, it's a soft target. Absolutely. And uh, the way it is now, I don't think there's anything that we are going to do in Washington, D.C., legislatively, that puts a dent in this from happening. And people say, oh, it's a mental health issue, but by the, we're, not, we're not throwing that much money into mental health. We're not going to do it. We know we're not going to do it. Uh, so, and it. Plus, that's a long-term solution. So in the meantime, uh, would you rather be completely unarmed and to the complete mercy of an idiot, a deranged idiot, or or would you rather have a fighting chance? And I'd rather have a fighting chance, Mike. I mean, granted, I'm not a 20-year-old college student any longer, but if I was, I think I'd want a fighting chance in defending myself. Uh, I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, this law doesn't just open up campus carry to every child or every person that is attending um, classes. There, there are still rules and laws about who can own a firearm and the training that you have to go to have a, uh, a concealed carry. So, you know, this, this, uh, this argument that, you know, you're going to put guns in the hands of, of kids that are, you know, too young to handle them, you know, I don't think every kid is going to run out and get a, a gun and put it in their pocket and carry it on campus. Uh, I think the vast majority won't. Uh, there will be a few here and there. They'll still have to go through some kind of training uh, to get their concealed carry. So, uh, I, And like you said, there's already states that have this. Uh, it doesn't seem to be a problem in those states, and, and I don't see why it would be a problem in, in West Virginia. This is the kind of hey Mike. This is John Gilstrap. Um, uh -huh. <clears throat> there's kind of the breakdown in the whole gun 
argument in America, I think. My son was actually a student at Virginia Tech during the Virginia Tech shootings and, and, and lost a couple of friends. And the way that that played out was not it was a, there was one guy with a pistol who very methodically went classroom to classroom and and popped people and then he went back and he shot them again and if anywhere along those lines somebody had been able to defend themselves in kind and shoot the the shooter how many lives would have been saved i don't understand why this isn't painfully obvious to people unless you accept the argument that guns are the reason that people are dying and that's not that's not the case. It's the guy behind the gun. And if we accept that as sort of the new normal, God help us, um, the ability to defend oneself is, is, is the last resort. It's, it's all we got. Well, I don't think the, the people that are arguing against this see it that way. They just see it as there will be a more guns on campus and there will be more shootings. And, and I disagree. I think those people that go on campus and start these shooting sprees have no regard for what the law is anyway. They don't care whether guns are allowed on campus or not. It, it's irrelevant to them because, in the end, they're the ones that have all the power. They're the ones with the guns, and, and they're just going to start shooting people. There's nobody to shoot back at this point. So they just don't care what the law is right now, and, and they're not going to care after this is passed either. I just hope that sometime um, – if one of these uh, cases arise, that there is somebody that has a firearm and can defend themselves and the other people around them as well. Matt Harvey. Um, <clears throat> this is a tough issue for me. Um, I, I was actually, I've actually, I was actually in a, in a school shooting in, in college. I did not know that. No, no. So, um, and I think about not having a gun. It was a gun-free zone and... Uh, the consequences of not being able to defend myself or anyone else uh, it's pretty tough and it just we 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 say they're too immature to defend their own lives but we straddle them with a mortgage sized student loan they're yeah. they're advanced enough they're mature enough to make that financial decision that will impact them for the rest of their life and they can join the service and they can join the service it's a complex issue um, and I think Mike hit it right on the head that you're not going to move the needle too much either way. People are pretty set in how they feel about this. Um, but um, let's go to DHHR. Well, but before we go on, Matt, you bring up a great point because you've been in that situation. And I wonder how many people who have been in that situation and they know that it's going on have felt to themselves at that point in time, I wish I had some way to defend myself, and it, and it's been taken away from them by current law. So, you know, and, and you don't have to elaborate if you don't want to, but, you know, how did you feel in that situation? Would you have liked to have had some kind of way to defend yourself or even somebody else around you to be able to do that? Yes, it would have saved lives. Yes. It so, would have I, saved mean, lives. I think that's our point, and I think that's the, the position that we're coming from. So DHHR, sorry. Yes, yes, yes. In, in, in my present occupation, um, this is a tremendous issue, and I noticed that you're on the Health and Human Resource Committee, and, and I know Charlie Trump is very passionate about this. I received an email from him asking for information at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, <laughs> and, and that tells you where his heart is. And I know a lot of other legislatures that have their heart on this issue as well. Um, what can we there's something that needs we all agree that something needs to happen what do you think is the is the best thing to happen with the HHR well, I, I would say what what is going on right now is probably the best thing to happen that this will allow um, the smaller organizations to focus in on those areas that that need to be addressed uh, in the three different divisions. And I think uh, uh, Delegate Hornby gave you a chart yesterday that sort of shows you the breakdown and how that will all um, all be dispersed. And I think just when you, when you have a secretary-level individual over, you know, a third of the number of departments that they were over before, I, I just feel like there will be efficiencies um, 
that we didn't have under the current uh, structure. So, you know, I think that's what everybody's hoping is that they'll be able to to get down into the detailed information. And I, in my current uh, position um, as the executive director of a an IDD waiver agency, um, I see the the inefficiencies in DHHR all the time. You know, we we deal with different individuals um, in DHHR, and and they have a level of frustration. They they feel like they can't do the things that they need to do sometimes. So it's very frustrating for us when we call them and and need their help, and they're frustrated because they don't have the ability to give it to us. So I'm really hoping that the division of DHHR will help um, take care of some of those inefficiencies and, um, you know, get us more detailed uh, help in those areas. We had the flow chart up yesterday about the proposed DHH uh, from yesterday about the uh, reorganization uh, with DHHR. Mike, have you seen that chart which lists the, it's yeah, a, you know, yes, like a spoke with wheel? Right? Um, and I, I watched your show um, last night with with Delegate Hornby and saw that, and, and Bill had some some brilliant insight to that. Make sure. I, Bill knows I said that. Um, yeah, Bill sent, me a, Bill sent me a question, and I'll just read it to you since you kind of touched on sure. that. Uh, the dotted lines indicate that the three elements are separate but share administrative services. Uh, yes. And also point two, the IG is structurally in only one element. Will the IG have access to the other two elements? So the answer to that is yes. The IG will oversee all the different elements of the former DHHR, even though they're being separated now. And that's part of the reason that they're being separated. The IG needs to have uh, answer to a separate secretary than the one that he's overseeing. So that's one factor. And the dotted lines, he's right about the dotted lines, that, that there's no oversight from that, that central administration. What that is is that is a shared uh, administration that has things like uh, human resources and payroll and purchasing and things like that that the different departments um, uh, or cabinet level uh, departments can share um, so that there's efficiencies there that not each uh, different department has to have you know their own human resources their own purchasing department so that's what that is um, it, it's not like an oversight over all three of them it's just it's shared administration Delegate Mike Height is our guest out of the 92nd. He is the Assistant Majority Whip, serves on finance, health and human resources, political subdivisions, senior children and family issues, technology and infrastructure as well. John Gilstrap. How is this legislation different than that which was vetoed by the governor last, uh, last session? Well, John, I don't know that it is a whole lot different. That I think what the, the governor was saying when he vetoed it last session is, I don't know enough about this situation to know whether we do need to split it up. And that's when he ordered uh, a report to be done, and, and the McChrystal organization went and they did a report. Um, they came back and, and you know gave it to the, the governor and the legislature, and that's sort of what we've gone off of. Um, now, the McChrystal report sort of just came down in the end and say, hey, we just need better communication and, and maybe things will be better. But the legislature felt like, you know, you, you're you're just being way too easy here. <laughs> you know, there are bigger issues than just the communication. So um, I, they went ahead and tried to do the same thing they did last time and, and splitting it up. They had a good uh, idea of how they wanted to do it, that it's it's sort of already split up um, in, in these phases, if you will, in um, in the budgetary process anyway. Um, so it seemed like a good division. It wouldn't um, it wouldn't affect the um, the federal money that we get in those different areas. So um, you know that's that's the route we decided to go. And I think the governor's on board this time. And the governor's office has been involved with the uh, development of the current legislation. Um, I can't say. 100% yes, I know that for a fact, but I am I am pretty sure that there have been talks behind the scenes uh, to negotiate a a, a, um, a bill that will get past all three phases, the Senate, the House, and the Governor's Office. 
And meanwhile, what does the temperature feel like on personal income tax reductions? Oh, Lord. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> So that that I believe that that debate is ongoing. Just the fact that we are not discussing it in the House yet leads me to believe that there is still negotiations going on between the House, the Senate, and the governor's office about what is actually going to come out. Um, and I just don't know that that they've reached an agreement and that. Um, we know exactly what what's going to come because it's got to come to the House next. We 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 passed a bill to the Senate. The Senate's passed a bill and sent it to us. Um, I don't know that the House bill is going to go anywhere. We're pretty much working with whatever the Senate bill is right now, um, and I guess they're trying to to negotiate and amend that bill itself. Um, so I'm thinking. Um, Tomorrow or Monday, we'll see something with that, um, but still not sure. Matt Harvey, I want you to tell Delegate Height what you told me a couple weeks ago when you were on about the penalties for passing a school bus and running over a child in West Virginia. Well, well, he, he, I stopped by his office unannounced last week, I believe it was, when I was down in Charleston, and and dutifully caught him behind his, his desk and working hard, and we did have a discussion <laughs> about the negligent homicide penalties. And Tell our audience what you what you told us a couple weeks ago. It's a misdemeanor. That we explain, explain the scenario and, 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 then, and then what the penalty is. If, if you're driving in a grossly negligent manner, reckless driving, uh, excessive, like, you know, drag racing, passing a school bus, in a, uh, doing 100 miles an hour in a construction zone, and you wreck and kill someone, you get uh, up to a year in jail, which means six months is your max penalty because you get day for day credit automatically when you go to jail on a misdemeanor. So I can I can speed past the school bus, mow down a six year old, and I might do six months in jail. Yes. Yes, that's that's the current state of the law. And, oh, and, but you'll lose your license for a year. It, and, and, that, and that's some crazy stuff. Yes. The, well, the way that's been so. And and I, here's what I I'm, I'm pretty sure I told uh, Mr. Harvey when he was in here is um, write the legislation and I'll put it forward uh, to fix this kind of stuff. I'm I'm not a lawyer. I just play one on TV, but. I, I, I'm not good at writing that kind of stuff. I wouldn't even know where to start. But if somebody with the expertise of a Matt Harvey were to to write that legislation, then I would definitely champion it and and, and try to get it passed. Well, I, I already sent a proposed bill down to Delegate Espinosa, and and we were working. That's even a better person to send it to. <laughs> and he's been he has very a lot more pull than me. <laughs> well, he's been supportive of it, very supportive, and and we've been working with the Senate. Uh, with with Senator Weld and mm-hmm. and Senator Rucker and, and Senator Rucker and Trump introduced a bill last year that didn't stall that that stalled out this year. I've, I when I talked to uh, Senator Weld yesterday, he's got a, a pro- some proposed language that he's going to introduce because it's it's past time for the House to introduce a bill. And, oh, I agree. And, but the and Senate, this is exactly the Senate how has legislation a, gets passed. Is it's just individuals. Um, you know, like yourself or or anybody else that that see um, a law that is is wrong or something that needs to be changed, and you know, you you contact your legislature. You 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 can even write it up or suggest how it be written yourself, and and then we try to get it passed. I mean, that's that's sort of how the system works. There, there's just there's just some uh, some case law that was causing some problems and, and some concerns in drafting an appropriate bill, and and that it reflects the seriousness of this charge to make it a felony that was causing some hang-ups and no fault to uh you know delegate espinosa was, has worked really hard on this and so i, th- I think we're going to maybe i'm hopeful that something will come out this year and we'll, and and i think there's a lot of support for it well i hope so too and then now that you've mentioned it uh, again i will We'll get with uh, Delegate Espinosa and find out where we are with that. Mike, I noticed you had a bill uh, sponsored, HB 3480, enacting the West Virginia Consumer Financial Privacy Act of 2023 that was pending in judiciary. Can you tell us about that bill and what its chances are? 
Yeah, um, <laughs> chances, who knows. <laughs> um, it's, it's essentially a bill that um, prevents the credit bureaus from selling your personal and financial information without you uh, giving permission. You would have to opt in anytime you do a, a credit report or something like that to, to buy a car or, or a bed or whatever. Um, you fill out this credit report, and right now the, the credit bureaus get that information. They compile that data, and they, and they can sell that. Um, to individuals um, now they can't tell you uh, individuals your what your your exact credit rating is but they can give a range and then you have a lot of people out there that that you know want to want to get you to to take out loans and stuff and and they'll send you you know all this information or they'll call you and, and try to get you to, to get these loans and stuff like that and I just don't think that the credit bureaus should be uh, allowed to sell your any any of your financial information without your permission. All right. Any final questions for Delegate Height? I think you're off the hook, Mike. You're off the hook, right. Good job, man. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time this morning. Anytime. Thank you very much. Delegate Mike Height.